Good evening, everyone. I'm Ronnie Stidvent, Director of the Center for Politics and Governance at the LBJ School of Public Affairs. And I'd like to welcome you tonight to this very special installment of the Center's Perspective Series. Um, as always, we are very grateful to AT&T for their support of the Center and our activities. And we are especially grateful tonight to Governor Bill Hobby for his generous su support in facilitating tonight's event. We have a number of special guests here tonight and a, and a wonderful crowd, and I'd like to just thank a few people for coming tonight. We are delighted to have with us um, the Texas Speaker of the House, Joe Strauss, so thank you for coming. We're also joined tonight. I mentioned Governor Hobby, who's here with us tonight as well. We're grateful for the support of President Powers, who's here. Our new Dean, Ambassador Bob Hutchings, thank you so much for joining us. And I'd also like to thank our most recent interim Dean, Admiral Bob Inman, thank you so much for your support in coming. And perhaps an award for traveling the farthest, our former Dean, uh, Deputy Secretary of State James Steinberg, thank you so much. The mission of the center is to infuse the study of political leadership and governance with a practical perspective. And one of the ways we do that is through our perspective series, where we bring in leading policymakers and practitioners to share their insights and experience with the campus community and the community at large. And so we're delighted tonight to have with us Secretary James Baker. We are thrilled that you all are here, and uh, we are also thrilled to be partnering tonight, not only with the LBJ Library, but with the Texas Tribune and Evan Smith, our latest uh, fellow. <laughs> Evan is the latest fellow at the Center for Politics and Governance. He has hosted our perspective series in a conversation style format this year. We're delighted with the way it's turned out. We think you will be too. And uh, so just a couple of housekeeping, housekeeping issues I'm gonna ask you a couple of requests. If you all would take a moment to please turn off and silence your cell phones, Blackberries, anything that might go beep in the night. That's the hard part. And now the good part. If you'd help me start tonight's program by welcoming our gracious host, the director of the LBJ Library, Mark Updegrove. Thank you, Ronnie, and, um, and welcome to all of you. Welcome to the LBJ Library. Um, I did a quick bit of housekeeping. For those of you who are friends of the LBJ Library, part of the membership, there is a reception in the Great Hall following this event, and we hope you join us there. For those of you who are not friends, we'd love to have you, and there is information about our program as you leave at the information desks. We hope to see you again. Well, about 10 years ago, I had the pleasure of uh, dining with James Baker at, uh, at a dinner in his honor. And he told a story that, that stuck with me. He talked about the, uh, how strange it was to be out of public life when he would be in places and people would kind of look at him and they didn't quite recognize him and kind of approach him and see if they knew him. And he told a story of one gentleman at, at an airport who spotted him and got the, got the courage to come up, and he said, you're Jim Baker, aren't you? And Secretary Baker said, well, why, yes, I am. And he said, I thought so. How's Tammy Faye? <laughs> but, but for those of us who appreciate the great statesmen and political minds of our age, James Baker is at the top of that list. He has served as Under Secretary of Commerce for President Ford. He served as Chief of Staff and Secretary of the Treasury for Ronald Reagan. And he served as Chief of Staff and Secretary of State for George H.W. Bush. In recent years, he has continued to be active in public life as an envoy to George W. Bush 
on Iraqi debt relief, and as co-chair of the Federal Election Reform Commission with Jimmy Carter, and who remains active today as honorary chairman of the James A. Baker Institute for Foreign Policy at, Rice's, uh, at Rice University. Interviewing Secretary Baker this evening will be our friend Evan Smith, the former editor of Texas Monthly and the founder and current editor of the Texas Tribune. It is my great honor to welcome to this stage Secretary James A. Baker and Evan Smith. Mr. Secretary, how are you, sir? I'm fine, Evan. How Thank are you? Thank you very much for being here. We're honored to have you. It's my pleasure. I'm May delighted I say, to be here. For a man who's about to be 80 years old, you look pretty good. I'm only 79, Evan. <laughs> <laughs> have I given it away, Secretary? <laughs> um, uh, I thought Mark's story about Tammy Faye Baker was great, but I want to ask you to tell one more before we get into the serious stuff about being recognized or not being recognized. You tell a great story about being in your pickup truck. This is after the 92 election. You're filling your, uh, filling yeah, your truck well, up, the, I think? Well, I was going down to my ranch at Pearsall, and I uh, was running out of gas, and uh, so I had to go off the interstate and went into Welder, a little town in central Texas, uh, where there was a, a gas station. I pulled up to the pump, and there was this guy in a really ratty pickup truck there who'd filled his car, his truck up. I mean, I, I noticed he was looking at me, and he was looking at me, and he was looking at me. And I went in, and I paid my bill, he paid his. He followed me out. He came right out and stuck his face right in mine. He looked at me and he says, you're Agnew, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> Agnew. Agnew had been dead for 10 years. <laughs> well, m m Mr. Secretary, we know who you are. Don't worry. <laughs> No, no fear of that. Uh, there's a lot to talk about, and, and the temptation is to go right to the Middle East, which is, of course, an area that you know extremely well. But there are two big issues that have popped on our radar screen in the last couple of weeks. I want to get you all some glasses here. At the... Wow. I assure you, this is not a magic trick, Mr. Secretary. <laughs> hey, Mark, you ought, to, you ought to break for some glasses here, by the way. Okay. Is that one okay? Great. That looks all right. All right. Um, <laughs> I bet hey, you, hey, Mark, I bet how do you governor, think it's going so far, huh? I bet, <laughs> I bet you Governor Hobby would spring for that. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm going to resist the temptation, Mr. Secretary, to talk about the Middle East and instead ask about two things that are on everyone's radar screen uh, in the foreign policy arena these days. Uh, first, Mexico and then Israel. Uh, you know that yesterday, Secretary Clinton... Secretary Gates, Secretary Napolitano led a delegation of uh, high-ranking Obama administration officials to see President Calderon uh, to talk about the issue of violence in Mexico. Uh, it obviously has a disproportionate impact on Texas. I wonder, as someone who is, there's no problem you've not seen and no situation you haven't been asked to, to, to comment on, what you think about that and, and, and what place the country, our country, has in the conversation? Well, I think it's a very unfortunate situation, of course, and I think it's a dangerous situation, but the trip, I, I believe that that group of cabinet officials is uh, a follow-on to something, frankly, that started uh, uh, in the first year or two of the uh, Bush 41 administration called the Binational Commission which the purpose of which was to concentrate a little more on the relationship between uh, Mexico, between uh, the United States and our neighbor to the south. Uh, in, during those discussions, there's always a lot of uh, focus on interdiction, the drug problem, trade, that sort of thing. Uh, I thought things were getting a little better when NAFTA passed and generated greater uh, economic activity both for the United States and for Mexico. Yes, I happen sir. to believe as one who supported it, that NAFTA was a big success. Uh, but I, I'll be very frank to tell you, Evan, I don't know what the answer is to the drug violence that's uh, going on down there now. Uh, if Mexico's um, uh, economy picked up, uh, that would help the immigration problem. I'm not so sure it would help the drug problem as long as we have the demand uh, for drugs that exists here on this side of the border. And I'm not saying that you need to do something um, um, spectacular like uh, legalizing drugs in this country, but somehow we need to focus, I think, a little bit more 
on the demand side of the problem. I don't know what the answer right. is to doing that. One other problem, and it's difficult to talk about it. Uh, you can't talk about it, as Jim Steinberg knows, when you're an official of the State Department. <laughs> but when you're out, you can talk about whatever you want to. <laughs> and, uh, and I think corruption in Mexico is one of the major difficulties uh, with dealing with this problem. Is that a problem that can be dealt with? Uh, uh, if it, it's got to be dealt with uh, in Mexico and by Mexicans. Uh, but everybody down there, sad to say, not everybody, that's an exaggeration, but so many people are on the take. And these drug, drug cartels are making so much money. Uh, and, and, and you take a, a federalist uh, police officer there who's making a few pesos a day, and you offer him a lot of money to let, uh, uh, to let something come through or to turn his head when there's drug violence. It's just darn, darn hard to get a, hold, get a handle on that. What do you think President Calderon should be doing? I mean, I'm, I'm sure you were going to tell me you're I, reluctant to offer advice to the president yeah, of Mexico. Well, but Well, I am even when I'm out, but because I don't really know. I don't have the answer to that. I think he's... Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, uh, I have respect for, the, for that particular president of Mexico. I think he's honest. I think he's trying to do his best. Uh, but somehow you got to grapple with and get control of that corruption problem. And I'm not suggesting for one minute that it extends all the way up to the president of Mexico. All right. Let me move on to Israel. Uh, Mr. Netanyahu was in the States this week. Uh, we seem, at least if you believe press reports, to not have moved the needle terribly on the conflict over the settlements in Jerusalem. Uh, you know that there was a uh, an appearance by Vice President Biden in Israel a few weeks back, and there was a perceived slight mm -hmm. against this country in the way that uh, the settlement issue was discussed by Mr. Netanyahu at the time. Th that is a, continues to be a crucial relationship, you, the United States and Israel. Um, t give me your perspective on, on the relationship as you believe it stands right now and, and this particular problem, and to the degree that you can on Mr. Netanyahu himself. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, well, let me preface everything else I say <clears throat> with this statement. I don't care whether you're a Republican or a Democrat or uh, what administration is in power uh, in Washington, we will always be there for Israel's security. That does not mean that we should uh, excuse behavior that moves uh, in the wrong direction in terms of U.S. foreign policy interests and our Israeli foreign policy interests. Right. And they're not necessarily congruent in all respects. We have our own foreign policy interests in that region. We're obviously interested in stability. Israel's our strongest ally in the region. We are interested in her security. But we're also interested in making sure that, that she finds a way to negotiate peace with her Arab neighbors. The only way Israel will ever achieve a secure peace secure peace, is to negotiate peace with her Arab neighbors. The only borders she has today that are secure are the borders with Jordan and Egypt, with whom she has negotiated peace. So we should do whatever we can, bearing in mind that we will always be there for Israel's security, right. to encourage her to, to negotiate in good faith and find a way to reach a peace agreement with her Arab neighbors. The demographics are such that she... If Israel wants to maintain its uh, Jewish character and its, dem and its uh, democratic character, it cannot forever stay in occupation or possession of those Arab lands because the demographics are going are gonna to go against them. And if you get to the point where everybody has a vote, they'll be overwhelmed unless she turns to some sort of an apartheid-type approach, which she's not going to do. Right. So it's really important, and more and more Israelis... Uh, uh, Ariel Sharon, with whom President Bush 43 uh, dealt, uh, concluded, so did Ehud Elmer, the prime minister who succeeded him, that in order to preserve Israel's democratic character and Jewish character, she had to find a way to negotiate peace with her Arab neighbors. And so it's extremely important. Now, there are always going to be tensions in any relationship. Uh, you can have tensions in relationships with, uh, with enemies. You have them all the time. But you can also have tensions in relationships with friends. Right now, we've got some tensions uh, in the relationship between the United States and Israel because when the vice president of the United States was over there, there was a very high-profile announcement by the Israelis that they were going to expand a settlement right. in East Jerusalem. 
Republican and Democratic administrations going as far back as the establishment of the State of Israel have always said that settlements are an obstacle to peace. They obviously are because the only basis for peace between Arabs and Israelis is uh, UN Resolutions 242 and 338, which require the transfer of land for peace. Right. So the minute you settle, it, if you start settling, building buildings, you foreclose any possibilities of negotiations. So it's always been U.S. policy that settlements are an obstacle to peace. And there was no real need to make a high-profile announcement like that and yeah. stick it in the eye of the Vice, Vice President, President of the United States, and that has created some understandable tensions. Secretary Clinton described it as an insult. Would you go so far as to say it was an insult? It was clo to pretty close to it, but, yeah. you know, I, I, I don't know whether I'd describe it that way because I made nine trips there, and every time I uh, went to Israel, they announced a new settlement. And so... <laughs> so and this so, is par for the course, So then, I'm, right? <laughs> I'm inured to that. <laughs> I, I'm immune from that... Uh, uh, from yeah. that, but, but th we don't need that. We don't need that in the relationship, and I think the way that Secretary Clinton and President Obama articulated their uh, opposition to that by saying, look, this is not just, uh, uh, this doesn't just go to the issue of settlements, it also goes to the, to the more fund fundamental issue of the relationship right. uh, between, there needs to be respect on both sides. We need to respect Israel and her uh, needs and, and uh, goals and desires, and she needs to respect us and to understand that we do have our own uh, foreign policy interests in that region. Right. Uh, what do you think about Mr. Netanyahu as a leader of that country? Well, Bibi's a good guy, in my opinion, yeah. but even though I barred him from the State Department when I was Secretary of State. <laughs> and I'll tell you why I did that. I mean, I, I don't mind saying it uh, out loud. Uh, he went out in Israel, in Tel Aviv, and did something not unlike what's just happened with this settlement. He went out and he said, uh, uh, American policy in the Middle East is based on lies and distortions. And I saw that in my office on the seventh floor of the State Department. And I said, wait a minute. I said, we wouldn't take that from the Deputy Foreign Minister of the Soviet Union. We're damn sure not going to take it from the Deputy Foreign Minister of Israel, to whom we give all this largesse courtesy of the U.S. taxpayer every year. And so I barred him from the State Department. Now, we've become good friends since then. I see him a lot when he comes to the United States. He wrote me a very, very long and effusive letter of apology. But I think, and I may be wrong about this, I think he's a lot more pragmatic than people think he is. Mm -hmm. I really honestly believe that he would love to be the Prime Minister of Israel who brings peace to his people. Mm -hmm. I really believe that. And I predicted a year ago that he would make a deal with Syria. So far, that prediction is not looking very good. But, but I still believe that it's possible. There's still time. Mr. There's still here. time. That's, That's right. exactly right. Uh, as a segue into the uh, Middle East and the issues of Iraq and Afghanistan and Iran, I believe General Petraeus was the one who said this week that he believed for us to have peace in the Middle East, we needed to see peace between Israel and Palestine. That's correct. It is the, you, it, you, you agree with General Petraeus? I agree with his statement to that effect. Yes. It is one of the overriding issues uh, in, 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 you know, foundation issues right. in the Middle East. And we've got to find a way to, uh, to make that happen. And I happen to believe that, that uh, this administration has a wonderful opportunity to do that. Talk about that. Well... I think everybody understands that time is running out. They've got a big problem. I say they, our administration has a problem because the Palestinian polity is divided. Pretty hard to negotiate peace uh, when you don't have all the Palestinians at the table. Right. And today you've got Hamas on the one side that we will not deal with because they're a terrorist organization, neither will the Israelis. And then you've got the Palestinian National Authority with whom, with whom we de do deal. They, they control the West Bank. Hamas controls Gaza. But the fact of the matter is we had that same situation back when I was Secretary of State because we could not deal with the PLO, Palestine Liberation Organization. They were a terrorist organization. The Israelis wouldn't deal with them. We wouldn't deal with them. So we found a construct that would enable us to talk to, to people who were sympathetic to the PLO position. We found people... We found Palestinians from within the territories, and we began to negotiate with them, right. with the approval of the Israeli government, by the way. And let me just digress here for a minute, because you asked about Bibi. 
uh, I dealt with a really hard line Israeli prime minister. I dealt with Itzhak Shamir, who when Bibi Netanyahu was first prime minister of Israel, said he was squishy and soft. Hmm. That's how hard the guy was that well, I dealt, dealt with. with right. But yeah. we made progress. <laughs> and we, we got the Arabs to change 25 years of policy and come to the table face to face to negotiate peace with Israel. So back to back to the uh, the split in the Palestinian polity, maybe maybe there would be a construct or a cut out way to to start dealing indirectly with with Hamas. Get the and and so you bring them into the, the equation because you're never going to get peace as long as you have half the Palestinians not at the table. Okay. And I I think they ought to take a look at what we did in in, uh, in '91 and see if that something like that doesn't work. Well, let's move into the, to the question of Iraq and Afghanistan first. Um, yeah. Vice President Cheney has now said somewhat famously that he believes the country is less safe today than it was when President Bush was in office. Do you believe that? I don't know whether that's true or not. Nobody will ever, nobody, nobody will ever know. How do you know? Uh, how does he know? My good friend. He, mm -hmm. And he is. He's my right. very good friend. Well, matter, yeah. matter of fact, I want to tell you something. I wish you probably would. don't know this. Yeah. Everybody thinks that George H.W. Bush got me in national politics. He, he did. He helped a lot. Without him, I would never have been in national politics. But it was Dick Cheney who picked me out of obscurity as a deputy secretary of commerce and made me, the first of all, the delegate hunter for Jerry Ford right. in the nomination fight against Ronald Reagan and then chairman of the President Ford Committee. In the, that was in when, the the vice, when the vice president was chief of staff to President Ford. That's when, that's when Dick Cheney was chief right. of staff to President, President Ford. President he was Ford, a 32-year-old yeah. chief of staff. Right. So he really, as much as anybody, got me in, in national politics. But, yeah. How do you know he's right? On? I have no, Don't I, know. I have no well, way. Well, then let me ask it's you. It's a good yeah. political point, by it the is. way. Uh, explain. Well, because, because it's, it's been proven that, uh, that when, you, when you talk about the security of the American people, right. it resonates with the American people. Right, but if you can't and, prove that it's true, then is it a helpful well, thing to say you, it? You, it's helpful f f for his, his side of the political equation. Is right. damn help. Right. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Right, but the substance of it, not so much. You don't know. Who yeah. knows? Okay. Well, don't then know. let me ask you to stay away from the politics for a second and simply <laughs> characterize in a substantive way how you think the administration has done, first on Iraq and then on Afghanistan, as one of the people who knows those two subjects. You mean Iran, best. not Iraq. Uh, no, Iraq. I want to ask oh, you about, the Iraq? Iraq, about the pro prosecution of the Iraq war in the Obama administration and the prosecution of Afghanistan, as the mm. president has now laid it out. Oh, How do you believe that the, the president is doing on those two Well, well let me preface fronts. that by saying to you, as I said to some people upstairs, um, <clears throat> there, there, are, there are a number of things the administ this administration has done in foreign policy that I agree with. I just mentioned one on the Arab-Israeli yes, uh, conflict. There are others. Uh, one of them has to do with Iran, but you're not asking me that. Well, we'll as, far as, as far as Iraq is concerned, yeah. uh, I, I think that what they're doing is the right, is the right thing to do, to continue to, to uh, gradually draw down our forces. We now have a crunch point in Iraq because you had an election. <laughs> that, it's like our election. They were so damn close. Uh, you remember what happened in 2000? Yeah, when, I think I do, actually. So... Yeah. so <laughs> And let me tell you something, I had a lot of people call me when I was down there in Florida, and they'd say, what's the matter with you Americans? A cradle of democracy, you can't even run an election? What's going on there? And, and they would be former uh, foreign ministers or prime ministers I dealt with, and I'd say, well, Mr. Minister, let me tell you what's going on here. I'd say the rule of law is, is going to prevail. We're working through a very, very emotional situation here in this country, but we're doing it according to the rule of law. And, and that's going to prevail. And I dare say if this was happening in your country, there might be tanks in the streets. And some of them had to acknowledge that there might be. might be. So now we've got a difficult thing in Iraq. Very close election. The, par the, the, the prime minister of Iraq made a statement two days ago that's very, very disturbing. He said, we want to have a manual recount. It reminded me of the request for manual recounts right. in Florida. But anyway, he said, mm -hmm. we want a manual recount of all the votes. And if we don't get it, and, and he said, and I'm making this request as commander in chief of the Iraqi armed forces. Uh -oh. so, right. so we're at a difficult point. But w you're asking me whether I agree with what this administration has done in terms of right. prosecuting the Iraq war. I do. I Current think, strategy. I think they've done the right thing. On Afghanistan, 
uh, I, I think that I don't think President Obama had any uh, other option than to send in some additional forces after right. he said in the campaign that that was the just war and Iraq was the unjust war. So he pretty much had to put his uh, money where his mouth was, and he did. He, he made a mistake, in my opinion, by setting a date for beginning the withdrawal of those forces. You, you don't send 30,000 brave young Americans into a combat zone and say, but we're going to start pulling them out on such and such a date. That doesn't help you win that war. So uh, with, with respect to that one issue, I disagree yeah. with him on his conduct of Afghanistan. So the better, the better course to pursue, Mr. Secretary, would have been to send the troops in and then just not telegraph a potential end. No, yeah, don't telegraph, no. Then, the you, you, then you can pull them out whenever you think the, the situation on the ground uh, justifies that. Let me say one other thing about Afghanistan. that I, I'm glad Jim Steinberg's here because he's, he's not right now up there in the in the corridors of power, and they may have thought about this, they may not. We're over there in Afghanistan with 100,000 American troops, and we're taking care of a problem that, yes, was a problem for the United States, but it's also a problem for Iran, it's a problem for India, for Pakistan, it's a problem for um, China. They don't have, and Russia, all those countries, right. Or would be adversely impacted by an unstable Afghanistan. And they're not doing a damn thing. Right. So what would be wrong with getting them all together and working, doing a little uh, major league diplomacy and saying, hey, look, we all have a community of interest here. Right. You know, when the Iraq, when, when President Bush 43 uh, first sent troops into Afghanistan, we get, talked to the Iranians and cooperated with them because they do have an interest in a stable Afghanistan. Right. And there was cooperation. I think a conference of all of those countries right. say, in effect saying, okay, what are we going to do about this problem? Because it is a big problem. And I'm not at all sure that we're going to be able right. to prevail uh, the way we are now. I, it was interesting to me to see the other day that, that we're beginning to talk uh, to some of the Taliban, which is something I think we should do. You're for that. I'm for that uh, because I think that the Taliban uh, can be bought, uh, and if they can't be bought, they can be rented. So <laughs> we yeah. ought to talk to them. You'd be willing to do that, yeah. I think we ought to talk right. to them. Of course, you don't give up anything by talking right. to them. Well, I, but I don't believe, Mr. Secretary, that, that the U.S. became the world's policeman as far as Afghanistan goes in the last year. This, it, it, was no, not, it was not the case that we had more multilateral cooperation uh, on, on Afghanistan previously, and it went away. In fact, all along, it's been primarily, if not entirely, our folks over there. Yeah, but we did have some help, and uh, we did have some help back, back there when we first went in, when uh, President Bush 43 sent our first troops in there. It, it, the Iranians actually helped us. They so so if, if the Obama administration made an effort to reach out to, as you say, Iran and other countries and said, look, this is our problem, not just this the U.S.'s problem, problem, and they were reluctant or unwilling entirely to, uh, to commit troops, what would you have the administration do at that point? Well, what they're doing now. Continue a pace. What with they're the, doing with the, now, with which, the is to try, which is to try and win it militarily and, right. and win it without any help from any uh, adjacent countries. It's going to be a tough road to hoe. Is Even it, the yeah. defense secretary has said that on many occasions. Is, is it winnable, sir? I, I wonder. You know, we talked yes. about Mexico. You said, well, this is a huge problem. It's intractable. It's been ever thus, and I'm not certain that we can do anything about it. Can we, in fact, do anything about Afghanistan? Well, we can't unless we can somehow... Uh, uh, Establish a government there that is credible, uh, and right now there's some serious question about that. Uh, Are you a Karzai we, and, fan? And we or can't, but first, you got to decide what is your goal. If right. you, is your is your goal to nation build in Afghanistan, or is, is it to uh, create a, a, a government there? Uh, I think it. I think it's to establish a government there that can control uh, events within Afghanistan. That's a much lot more. No, Modest goal. That's and what I, it should I be. I think yeah. that's what the administration's goal is. Yes, right. And and uh, I don't think you know. I think that uh, President Obama will have significant pressure from uh, his constituencies to to get out of there at the first opportunity. That's why he put that date on there. Right. Because he had a lot of uh, pressure from his uh, political allies. Are you a Karzai fan? No. Or not not a fan of Karzai. No. What's I don't know him. I don't know. I should right. say this. I don't. I've but never, from a I've distance, you're not a fan. I've never met him. Yeah, yeah. For, what, what should the administration's position be with regard to President Karzai? President Karzai. Yeah. Well, he's the only. He's the only game in town. Yeah. 
right now, he's the only one. We're not going, there's not going to be anybody. We just had an election, and we acknowledge the election. We acknowledge the results of the election, regardless of what the deficiencies are. Got to work with them. Hmm? Yeah. Got to work with them. Yeah. yeah. So you like what the president's doing on Israel. You like what the president's done on Iraq. You like, but for the date certain, what the president's doing on Afghanistan. Yeah. What don't you like that the president is doing in foreign policy? Well, I, uh, I don't think we handle Honduras very well. I mean, that was a, that we, we, there was a little knee-jerk uh, liberal reaction to that that I thought was regrettable because I don't think that was a political, I don't think that was a military coup in the normal uh, nature of, of things in S South American military coup. And we fumbled around with it for a long time and, right. and we finally got it right, but it, but it was not, it was not handled. Uh, particularly well. I, uh, I hope that we're not, by, with all this spending, I, m before we get out of here, we ought to talk about one of the biggest problems facing the country, this big debt bomb we got out there, and I worry about what that may do or not do to the readiness of our forces and to our spending on defense. Okay. Well, let me get to Iran, and then we'll get into some okay. domestic stuff. So uh, what to do there, obviously. What to do, I, I support what's being done. I mean, I'm not one of these people who thinks you either talk to people or you shoot at them. I mean, there's a, they're, 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 they're middle ground. They're, they're, it's not an either or situation. And I'm not one of these people who thinks that by talking to a, an enemy, you somehow give him something. You don't if you know what you're doing. So I think talking to them is a good idea. So sitting down with, the, with, the, with Iran, which was a campaign issue, after all, in the last presidential race, you actually support the idea of sitting of, down... Of offering yes, to, because offering they, to. they won't sit with us. Right. Just like when, when I was Secretary of State, we, were, we had a policy that we would meet with Iran at any time, provided it was an official level, right. and we would discuss all the issues between us, including support for terror. But they had vilified us as the great Satan for right. so long, they couldn't sit with us. They didn't have the political support uh, domestically. So what do you do in Iran? You talk to them. You support the reformers in the streets. That's not an either or either. Some people will write, oh, you can't talk to that regime. You strengthen it, and you cut the ground out from under the reformers in the streets. Well, what the hell do you think we did for 40 years with the Soviet Union? We talked to the Soviet Union right. for 40 years, and every time I'd go over there or any other Secretary of State, we would work with the dissidents and the people who were being persecuted, and we, we got uh, many, many Soviet Jews to immigrate and so forth. So that's the same way we ought to go uh, with Iran. Uh, we ought to um, not... We ought to recognize that military action to end Iran, Iran's nuclear... Uh, endeavors or desires yeah. is, is iffy at best. The one thing it will do, in my opinion, is strengthen that hardline regime. And here we are by, by offering to talk to them. I think we've generated or helped generate a substantial political opposition to that hardline regime. Mm -hmm. And the worst thing in the world we could do is to, is to drop a bomb in on Natanz, which is one of their nuclear uh, plants. I yeah. mean, I think they learned from the Osiric reactor event in 1982 with the Iraqis uh, when the Israelis took it out to harden everything. It's moved all around the country. We might be able to delay their getting a bomb, but I don't think we can prevent it militarily. And I know that the Israelis, I say I know, I'm pretty sure the Israelis cannot prevent it either. They might delay it. Mm -hmm. But they came to the prior administration, the Israelis, and asked for overflight rights refueling capabilities, uh, bunker-busting bombs, and deconfliction codes. And President 43 said, no, that's not in our national interest. So I think we need to recognize that military action is not a simple, oh, we'll do a surgical strike, and that will end Iran's nuclear efforts. That's just not true. And the last thing I would, I would do is, is not forget about deterrence. Deterrence, and do, when you talk talking about deterrence, that doesn't mean you're saying, well, well, then you're just saying Iran should have the bomb. I'm not saying that. Iran is a huge force for instability in that part of the world, right. and we should do everything we can to deny them a nuclear weapons capability. But we ought to also realize that deterrence has worked in the past. It worked for 40 years against a much stronger opponent in the Soviet Union. And we kept the peace by these 35, in those days, 6,000 nuclear warheads that we had. 
And I don't know why we can't quietly pick up the phone and call that government over there, whether it's a head ayatollah or whoever it is, and say, hey, you even so much as blink. Uh, you, you develop a nuclear weapon and you even so much as blink at our friends in the region, and those friends are Israel, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Egypt, and the Gulf states, or at us, and guess what? It'll be a really bad thing for you because we have 3,500 strategic nukes. Mm -hmm. It takes us 20 seconds to re-aim them on you, and by the way, they've just been re-aimed on you. <laughs> now, now, I don't think, I'm serious. You're pretty good at Jim, this, may I observe that? Jim's gonna have a heart attack, <laughs> but, but let me tell you something. I might have one also, actually. <laughs> well, let me tell you something. Those Ayatollahs may be crazy, but they have a strong interest in self-preservation. Yeah. And we could, I mean, this is a message I think they would understand. Um, just to, to one last point on Iran. You said that we ought to be dealing with the reformers. Did the administration do enough to deal with and support the reformers during the election? I think so, yeah. They were, they were a little tentative at first. But they, they came around, and I think they did. And I, I think they did. And, and, you know, when I say support the reformers, I mean more than just rhetorically. We ought to be sending Farsi language broadcasts in there. We ought to be doing the very same things we did with the Soviet Union uh, during the Cold War. And I think we probably are doing a lot of that. We're doing a lot of covert stuff, I'm sure, uh, which we ought to be doing. Okay. Let me uh, come back home and do a little bit of domestic stuff before we get into the Q&A, if that's okay. Uh, we witnessed like it or not, a historic moment this weekend in this country, the passage of health care reform and then the president's signature on that legislation on Tuesday. Uh, you have been part of a number of administrations, advised presidents. You've seen a number of presidents, well-intentioned, talk about health care reform of different sorts in this country, not be able to get it passed. Could you reflect on this moment and if you want to get into, I hope you will, the specifics of what has just passed and been made into law Talk about the impact of this on this country. I got to tell you, I don't know anything about health care, really, except that I'm 80 years old. And, and uh, when they say they're going to pull the plug on grandpa and grandma, I'm grandpa. So I, I don't. So my number one question about this bill that just passed, they say they're going to save $436 billion in re Medicare cuts. Mm -hmm. You don't think that doesn't worry me? At 80? It does. Yeah, because I don't want somebody, I don't want some bureaucrat saying what kind of treatment I can get in the latter stages of my life. Now, more importantly, if we were really dedicated to the idea of reducing health care costs, why isn't there anything in that bill about tort reform or medical malpractice reform, which is one of the most significant costs? in our health care system. So I, I have some, some problems with the, with the bill. Do you not believe uh, the CBO's numbers, Mr. Secretary, that shows that over a period I think of you time... Have to, uh, I think you have to believe CBO. I say budget that, will come down. Well, the reason I say that is because we used to use CBO well, all the right. time. Well, that's right. So They so can't just be right you when you like no, what they say and no, not be correct. right when they don't. So right. you yeah. heard me say we have to believe CBO. Yes, sir, absolutely. But, but nobody... But, you know, when we passed the Medicare prescription... Uh, uh, benefit. No, when we passed Medicare, sorry, when Medicare passed way back there, when it's going to be $9 billion, it costs something in the neighborhood of 75 or more. I mean, that's how yeah. far off. They, they can be wrong. They can really be wrong. Right. So you don't really know. Uh, but I'd like to, I'd like to, you asked me, uh, from the standpoint of someone who's lived there in that White House at the right hand of the president. Yes, sir. I think the, the president made a fundamental mistake in not sending up his own bills, but in subcontracting out his policy to the leadership of the Democratic Party in the House and Senate. Because those elements of the Democratic Party, right. I think, are the most radical, maybe left would be a better way to put it, elements of, that part, of the party. In 1981, when we came in, we had a Democratic House, Ronald Reagan and George Bush. We had, some, we had a terrible economic situation. We focused with laser-like intensity on that economic situation, not on some peripheral issues, some of which might affect the economy, like health care. And I think the president should have focused on the economy first and foremost. Okay. And I don't think he should have subcontracted out his policies. He should have sent his own bill up there. He, he, he talked really... Uh, 
in a wonderful way about bipartisanship during the campaign. Now, you'll get a big argument. People say, well, Republicans weren't interested in bipartisanship. You don't even get one vote. They won't work with you. Well, guess what? You've got to give people a, a buy-in on the takeoff of the policy if you expect to get them to come across and vote for you. What did we do in 81? We sent our own uh, spending bill up and our own tax reduction bill. And then we went to the conservative or more moderate Democrats, and we work with them. And we brought them across so we had a bipartisan economic uh, program. That gives the, con the congressmen or the senators the ability to go home and say, look what I got you in the president's right. uh, economic package or in the president's health care. He could, if he'd done this with the, with the, he would have, in my opinion, he would have gotten some Republican uh, to come across and support him on health care. But that's not the way he did it. He gave it to the to the leaders. furthest left leaders and let them write the bill. You, you, I think that you, was a mistake. Yes, I really sir. do. And I think that was a function of have, uh, they looked at what happened to the Clinton health care right. and decided we're not going to do it that way. We're not going to send our own bill up there and get skewered. We're going to let them craft it up there and we'll sit lay back here and then take a position at the very end. Well, that's what he did and he won. So, you know, winning is winning. I... A win is a win. I've been in there, and it's better right. to win than it is to lose. Uh, and so you, you can't fault it too much, but it's, it's not good to pass legislation that is this, as you, were, as you said, historic and fundamental without any support from the other side of the aisle. And the other mistake I think they made was not prioritizing. Uh, there's too many and there's too much stuff coming. Uh, cap and trade, stimulus, health care, jobs bill, whatever it might be. You would have put the economy first. I think we should have put, I think they should have put the economy right. first. Let me ask you about the tone of our politics as it relates to this health care bill. You are Mr. Republican. You're a Republican bona fides or without question. You're an establishment person to whom others look to uh, for, for support and for guidance and for how to behave. Temperamentally, you are the model for a lot of Republicans in this state. Is James Baker's Republican Party the kind of party that would uh, use the N-word against a African-American member of Congress or the F word against a gay member of Congress? I don't think so. Yeah. What, what has happened to the tone of this politics in this country? The well, opposition to stuff has become so divisive and personal and ugly? Uh, I, I was telling uh, Governor Abbey and I were talking on the plane coming up here, and I said, you know, Bill, I think, I think the two biggest problems facing our country today are this huge debt bomb that's ticking out there. We haven't talked about this yet, but I'm going to put on my Treasury Secretary hat and tell you, we have a GDP, uh, a debt to GDP ratio of 100% for three, the next three years. Debt to GDP of 100%. We haven't been there since World War II. And there's no, no real way out. So that's one of the problems. The other, yes, big, the other big problem and, and I don't want to put words in the governor's mouth, but I think he agrees with me, is our political dysfunction, which is what you're talking about. And we are in a sad state in, in this country where you no longer have any... You, you, you know, uh, when President Johnson was president, he was, the ma he was the master at reaching across the aisle and bringing Republicans across to support uh, initiatives that he thought were good policy. Uh, when Ronald Reagan was there, he and Tip O'Neill would work together, and they, they never agreed on anything in policy terms. And they'd fight like hell all day long, and then they'd go and have a drink uh, in the evening and, and uh, wait until the next day. But you don't see that anymore. You know, you don't see the ability to uh, disagree agreeably with people or to uh, be a political adversary but not a political enemy. Our politics has gotten so ugly. we got to find a way out of that. And I was interested to read uh, just a day or so ago in a column by Tom Friedman, who's a New York Times reporter. And he actually, he was the New York Times reporter on my airplane for four years when I was Secretary of State. And one of the things he suggests, and I don't know whether you can ever get this done or not, is to take the redistricting uh, process out of the hands of the professional politicians and put it in, put it in the hand give it to an uh, independent commission appointed of people, maybe some, t maybe technocrats. That might help a little bit, 
but but primary the primary system, uh, as the governor uh, said on our flight, uh, the primary system is a big problem, part of this problem too. Because Be, well, because it means that Democrats have to run more and more over to the left to get the endorsement of their party, and Republicans have to run more and more over to the right. I'm a firm believer that you that you have to govern from the center. If you don't, if you if you can't govern from the center, you're not going to have lasting a uh, lasting impact. But I, but I also think, I also think, generally speaking, you win elections from the center. Right. Generally speaking, you win elections from the center, not from the fringes. But our primary system encourages fringe uh, candidacies much more. I mean it. It's just, right. it's very tough. So and your message to the people on both sides, frankly, who've gotten so angry and are behaving so unpleasantly out in public on our politics, it would be part tone of down or keep it up or tone down? Tone it down. Part of this, though, well, but uh, politics is a blood sport, you know. Sure I is. mean, it's uh, not beanbag. And so you got to have wedge issues and stuff like that. But, but it, our politics has gotten, uh, it has gotten really, really very ugly. Let me ask you one more question before we open it up for questions from the audience. Speaking of politics, you endorsed uh, Senator Hutchison in the governor's race. Yeah. Will you be endorsing Governor Perry? I'm a Republican, and I don't want to see <clears throat> the Republicans lose 11 seats in the Congress by virtue of redistricting in Texas this coming year. Does that answer your question? Well, it's, uh, it answers my question sort of, but I didn't hear yes, and to borrow a phrase, a date certain. Well, I didn't say there was a date certain. Yeah. Well, he, is it, how about a date but, uncertain? But he knows, he knows I'm going to support him. So you will support he Governor knows. Perry? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, very well. Uh, I'll support the Republican nominee, and I think it's going to be Governor Perry. Well, I'm not aware of another one on the ballot, <laughs> so I suspect either. it's actually going to be. Uh, Mr. Secretary, it is, as always, an honor and a pleasure to sit across from you, and I thank you very much thank for your candor, sir. Thank you. <laughs> now, um, you all have some questions? Is that okay? okay. Mark, we're okay on time to have questions for the secretary. We have microphones, I believe, as, as always, in the aisle, and I would encourage anybody in the audience with a question for the secretary to come up, come forward. We'll recognize you and acknowledge you. And please forgive me if I know you and don't recognize you because my eyes are terrible. My Sir. name is Coke Wilson. Jim Baker and I were in law school together. Would you now take this opportunity to unleash what you wanted to say about the debt bomb? About what? He's a, a gentleman who was in law school with you, he says. Yep was asking if you would take the opportunity to unleash what you wanted to say about the debt bomb. I thought you did a pretty good summary of it, but uh, well, please yeah, feel I, free to go forward. Uh, I, I, the only additional thing I would say is that um, there is absolutely... The only way we get out of this, this problem is to find a way to cut spending, and there is absolutely no support, no political will in either party to cut spending. You cannot get, get out of this. If you think you can get out of this by raising taxes without any spending restraint, you're wrong. Why? Because you'll raise those taxes, and the Congress will spend that, and they'll spend more on top of it. So if you don't have spending restraint, you never get there by raising revenues. I'm not saying raising revenues is, is not worthwhile upon occasion, because it is, particularly when you have a fiscal uh, hole to dig out of like we've got. But it's no good to do it without spending restraint. And right now, there is no political will in, on the part of either party to cut spending. You believe so, it's on either party? There's no will. Yeah. Well, party. well, I think it is. I mean, we we just passed a Medicare. I mean, a medical prescription bill without uh, s specific provisions to pay for it uh, in the last administration. Now we've passed a health care bill that they say is going to be paid for by requiring people to. Uh, buy it to, to purchase and carry Medicare. The constitutionality of that, by the way, is going to be subject to a lot of court challenges by attorneys general from maybe 10 or 12 states and other people. Including this including one. Including here. Right. Is there a way for us to cut ourselves, uh, cut the budget out of the problem, sir? Without, without, without considering new, new taxes, is there a way for us to make enough cuts to get ourselves out of the problem? Absolutely. But there's no political will to do it. Yeah, you bet. Okay. You bet. Mr. Bell Al. Mr. Secretary, yeah. if you had a couple of minutes or a minute to tell one of your grandchildren about the essence of Ronald Reagan, how would you do that? I would tell them, I'd start by saying, you know, 
uh, well, how old would that grandchild be now? I've got 17 of them. Which one? I'd start by saying, you know, when Ronald Reagan was president, he was worried about your future. And, and even though he ran a deficit for the first three years or four years of his presidency, he cut tax rates so substantially that it generated such economic growth that we ultimately came into surplus. And we were in surplus for two or three years during the Clinton years. Much of that is attributable, in my view, to the fact that we reduced the marg top marginal tax rate from 70% to 28% during Ronald Reagan's presidency. And economic growth uh, generated a ton of uh, revenues for the, for the federal government. And I would tell him that, that uh, I am really sad about the situation we are in today as a country when we are running debt to GDP ratios of 100%. Haven't been there since World War II, and that doesn't count what's gonna happen when the baby boomers uh, hit Social Security and Medicare. That doesn't count uh, Social Security and Medicare explosions that are, that are yet to come. So I, I, I just think it's, uh, it's a very, very damaging situation. And if you'll, I, I try not to be too partisan, but let me make one statement that's factual that you will see, you will think is partisan. But in 15 months, uh, President Obama has increased our debt to GDP percentage more than Ronald Reagan did in eight years. Now that's staggering. I mean, we are, we are spending money like drunken sailors. We own banks, we own our, our automobile companies are all government owned now. We own AIG, the biggest insurance company in the world. We now just passed this, this uh, huge uh, health care bill and there are strong arguments for passing it. The idea of pre-existing, getting rid of pre-existing conditions. The idea that a country such as ours should have 30% of its people with absolutely no health care. Those are all important things, I understand that. But what's happening to us fiscally and economically is really scary. At least it is to me. Hello. Uh, several minutes ago, you talked about Afghanistan. And, uh, about what? Afghanistan. Afga Afghanistan. And you said that uh, you uh, disagree with President Obama on setting the troop withdrawal date. Yeah. Uh, so how would you address this new development when several days ago, uh, one of the most prominent Afghani insurgent leaders, Jalaluddin Hikmatyar, actually sent a delegation to uh, Kabul to talk to President Karzai. The delegation proposed a 10-point plan. Many experts actually call it one of the greatest breakthroughs during the whole war. And the, spokesperson, the spokesperson for this delegation, he actually said that they would not have done it if not for uh, President Obama actually setting the withdrawal date plan, that that encouraged them to actually negotiate. So how would you address that new development and whether you think it's actually a good thing? Well, that's an argument for setting a deadline, but I think there are other arguments against it because I think what it does with those, those uh, uh, Taliban who di don't send a delegation to Kabul, they know when we're gonna start pulling out. And when you're, in a, when you're in a war, it's not a good idea, I don't think, to tell your enemy, well, we're gonna fight you for six months and then, or, or a year and then we're leaving. Thank you. Ma'am. Uh, uh, Secretary Baker, uh, the commission President Obama wanted to establish to become more frugal in our running of our government, it wasn't supported by the Republicans. Why was that? Well, I don't think it was supported by the Republicans because they saw it. it. First of all, it had a majority of Democrats on it, and uh, the Republicans knew they'd be outvoted, and they thought that, uh, that uh, they would vote new taxes without any spending restraints, so they didn't support it. Mr. Mr. Baker, Mr. Secretary, they found Alan Simpson insufficiently conservative as an appointee to that commission. Who did? Well, I believe some of the opposition to the appointment of the commission was that Alan Simpson... No, no, there was no appointment. There, or, or there was a, a name floating. No, 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 no. She's talking about a, a statute, a, a piece of a proposal for legislation. That well, I thought she was talking about a commission. I'm no, sorry. No, yeah, sorry. yeah. But, she, but there, was a, there, was a stat, there was a proposal 
uh, for legislation, and the Republicans didn't support that. Ma'am, that's your, that's your question? No, I, it was the commission that was going to work together bipartisanly. Yeah, but it was, was to be established by, uh, by congressional action, by yes. legislation in the House and Senate. That's what, we, that's what, that's what the Republicans didn't support. Now, President Obama has appointed a commission by executive order, and the Republicans are appointing their members, so they are participating in that. Right. This, okay. I'm sorry. Sir. <clears throat> the last time that we faced a suicidal enemy, it took two nuclear bombs to get their attention. Today, that is clearly not an option. But enhanced interrogation certainly is an option. In dealing with prisoners of any nationality that engage in or support suicidal terrorism, I think there should be no restrictions on the effective use of this method because these people, by their action, have forfeited all their human rights. Do you have a question, sir? What do you think? <laughs> I got my answer. <laughs> what do you think? I think you need to, I think there can be, uh, upon occasion, a basis for enhanced interrogation techniques. When somebody, let's say, is captured on a battlefield, should not and cannot, in my opinion, rise to the level of torture, which is prevented and prohibited by the Geneva Convention to which we are a party. So I would be opposed to using... <laughs> I would be opposed to using any of those techniques that, that uh, cross that line into torture. That's pretty hard to say what kind of techniques you're talking about. You're probably talking about waterboarding. Yes. Is that right? Is that, yes. the, is that, is that the only one? I'm not an expert in that field. Uh, I, 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 I feel that, uh, that uh, the Obama administration has, uh, be, has been very wussy on this regard. Very, very wussy. Wussy. I'm not sure wussy. that that's an adjective, but that's wussy. fine, actually. Uh, Squishy. Thank you, sir. Yep. Okay. Ma'am. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Baker. Yep, sir. Um, you had talked, about, talked in your talk about uh, Iran being a destabilizing force in the Middle East. Yeah. And um, I wanted to know, and you also talked about our automatic, I would say, knee-jerk support for Israel. Uh, Israel has a nuclear weapon. Iran does not have a nuclear weapon, whether or not they are building one. Uh, Israel has attacked Iraq, as you, noticed, as you noted, in 1982, and their nuclear facilities um, extrajudicially. Uh, why is it that, why do we support Israel? Why must we support Israel? We support Israel because we, uh, we have an affinity with them uh, culturally, for one thing. They've been a very strong ally of ours for another. But we should not make it a knee-jerk type support. That's the point I was making. But, but we should support them. They are a strong ally uh, in the region. And we will continue to support them. There are a lot of reasons for that, some of which are political. But we will continue to support them. Uh, so it's a fact of life, but we should make sure that in, in supporting them, we, we encourage them in every way we can to do what we think is best for them and for our interest in the region, and that is negotiate a secure peace with their neighbors. We ought to do everything we can to encourage them to do that. And when they stick it in our eye, we ought to have the, pardon me, B-A-L-L-S, to stand up and say, nah uh we don't take that from our best ally. Friends don't do that to friends. And that's what the administration just did, and they're to be commended for it. Thank you. All right. Sir. I feel very privileged to be asking you this question. Thank you for the opportunity here. Mm -hmm. uh, you played a pretty important role in the end of the Cold War, and uh, the question I had for you is what do you how do you envision when and how the war on terror will end? Boy, nobody can answer that question. I don't think anybody uh, has a, a crystal ball that would, uh, that would answer that question for you. But I do think this. I think we need to be more cognizant 
of our soft power capabilities in this country. We need to do a better job of understanding that every Muslim is not a terrorist. We need to make sure we make that clear, <laughs> make that clear to people around the world. And, and we ought to use our, our hard power and our soft power. But when, but when we have people who attack us, we should fight back without, without any quarter, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, you take what, what happened on 9-11, uh, I mean, uh, the, there's no, there's absolutely, we should give no quarter in that, in that part of the war on terror. But we need to use our soft power in a little bit better way. Thank you. I'll ask another question, Mr. Secretary, since there's no one else behind me. Well, uh, I, mi I might do a 180 there and see that there is, but that's okay. No, no, but you, ma'am, you go ahead, please. Feel free. No, there is somebody behind you, but that's okay. okay. Just briefly, won't universal health care help the economy because we'll have a well citizenry? Have a what? A, a well, well citizenry. citizenry. The citizenry citizens will be, will be well. The they assumption. can work. Why shouldn't we have universal health care and do what it takes to get the ball rolling? Well, Thank universal you. health care doesn't mean everybody's going to be well. Health care, <laughs> health care, you have, you have health care, you have health care to take care of sick people. You and there, to people prevent, are doing, to prevent to prevent bad well, health. Well, some of it's well, preventive. Let's, let's let him answer the question. Some of it's preventive, true, but you're going to still have sick people, and that's the purpose, I suppose, of why it's important to cover the 30 million people who were not covered until day before yesterday. Actually, they won't be covered until 2015, because the taxes kick in soon, but the coverage doesn't start for some time. That's part of the way you make it fiscally neutral. <laughs> Ma'am. Sir, you seemed rather reluctant uh, during your conversation to explicitly support Governor Perry in the race this year. <laughs> and I was wondering if you could say a few words about the talk that's been around that he may be setting up a run for the presidency about in the what? future. Say a few words. Uh, the question is asking if you would say a few words about the talk that Governor Perry is considering running for president in the hey, future. Hey, look. I, I've done fundraisers for Governor Perry uh, in his prior races for public office. I, uh, when I was Treasury Secretary, I started doing fundraisers for him. I've always supported him. I will support him uh, in the next go-round. As Evan pointed out, I happen to think that uh, Senator Hutchison would make a damn good governor of Texas. So I supported her. She's a personal friend. I've worked with her for many years in the Republican Party. That doesn't have anything, that doesn't say anything about my lack of uh, support for Governor Perry in the general election. Uh, I happen to be a Republican. I've spent a lot of my life trying to build a Republican Party, not just in Texas, but nationally. When I became a Republican in, 19, uh, in 1970, there weren't any Republicans in Texas. <laughs> I mean, it was a hanging offense to be a Republican in Texas. <laughs> Well, you made a point, when, and when you endorsed Senator Hudson, you made a point of saying very clearly, this is not, not for him. That's right. It's for her. That's correct. Right. That's absolutely right. Uh, now, to the questioner's point, what do you think about Governor Perry as a potential presidential candidate? That was, I believe, the, the question. Well, I, I, think that, yeah. I, think that, uh, I think that we Republicans ought to develop as many first-rate candidates as we can, and he would certainly be my preference over any Democrat who was running. How does that mean? <laughs> I don't think that was quite clear enough, actually, uh, <laughs> Mr. Secretary. I hate to be partisan, but you forced me into it. Oh, you've been nice Just for a me. while. You go ahead and say what you want. That's fine. Sir. Mr. Baker, yeah. uh, thank you for being in Austin today. You're a great American and a better Texan, and that's important to all of us. Thank um, you. My question is, and for those of us who are working in this country and, and paying our taxes, um, and proud of that I am, what do you feel about jobs, uh, the fact that many people don't have them, and that we are at nearing unemployment rates that are staggering? How are we going to put people back to work in this country so that they can pay taxes, uh, taxes and be good Americans and Texans? Well, that's something that the administration is now working on. We just passed a jobs bill with, with bipartisan support, by the way. 
I don't know what the count was, but there was. It was, it was better it was than the healthcare. Good, yeah, so so a <laughs> little, little better than healthcare. Well, it wouldn't take much to be better than healthcare. So, you know, um, look, you're talking to, <laughs> you're talking to somebody who ran against Ronald Reagan. I ran George Bush's campaign against Ronald Reagan for the nomination in 1980. And I was stupid enough to characterize the Reagan economic program as voodoo economics. <laughs> and uh, and then, I, then I ended up being Ronald Reagan's White House chief of staff. Now, how that happened, I'll never understand. <laughs> it, maybe, it, maybe it speaks to the broad gauge nature of Ronald Reagan. But then even more uh, amazingly, I became Ronald Reagan's treasury secretary. So I am a reformed drunk when it... <laughs> when it comes to supply-side economics. So I really hate to see us jacking up taxes at a time when the economy is really in bad shape. I don't think, I think most people now agree that raising taxes at bad economic times is not the right thing to do. But you gotta understand you're talking to a Ronald Reagan Republican, so that's naturally where I'm coming from. But I would submit to you that when we did it, it worked. It did work. So we need, to, we need to be thinking about that a little bit more too. Instead of just raising them, let's be thinking about what we can do to generate economic activity because that's where jobs are created. When, when the president says, Mr. Secretary, that he means to cut taxes on the middle class and he has tax cuts that's as part great. of his plan, you, you, you take him in his work. That's great, yeah, but let's see it. Where, where's the meat? Where's the beef? What do you say? Where, where's the legislation? <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's... What? Stimulus package of 40% tax cuts. No, I don't think so. I, don't, I find that hard to be. The, the stimulus package, $750 billion, was a collection of a lot of items that a lot of the poobahs in the Democratic House had been trying to pass for a long, long time. That's what that was. And there were some tax reductions in there. Not many, not too significant, and not for very long. But you know, we're gonna let the Bush tax cuts uh, expire, that's fine, but that is in fact a tax increase. So taxes are gonna go up a lot more than just what you see that are gonna be levied on you here to pay, to pay for this health care. For the first time in your lives, you're, if you make over $250,000 a year, you're going, to, as a couple, you're going to be taxed on your interest income, on your passive income. If you have any rental income or any royalty income or any interest income, you're going to be taxed on it to pay for the health care bill. Now, that's not something M that's M going to generate that. That's not something that's going to generate economic activity. Okay, Mr. Secretary, I'm very clear on what you're against. Let's talk about what you're for. Well, in the, I'm in answering the, the question. Those, <laughs> in the absence of those increases, can you tell us, sir, what you'd be for? In, in, in view of your feeling that no tax increases, what would you, how would you propose to the questioner's point? Which was what? To bring, the well, to bring jobs back. What would, how would you stimulate the economy? Well, well I think the job, I already mentioned the jobs program that right. they've just passed would be one thing. But I'm not a Keynesian when it comes to uh, economics. And so I don't, I don't really believe that, that government programs are the way to, uh, to bring jobs back. Uh, it, was, it was a good thing to do at the time we did it. The stimulus package, I think, still hadn't kicked in. Still, the money hadn't, still, hadn't been spent. Uh, but I'm, that's just not my philosophy of economics. I happen to believe that if you lower marginal tax rates, you generate a great deal more economic activity and growth, and that creates jobs. All right. The gods of time are telling me one more question. Is that right? One Mr. more. Mr. Baker? Yeah, sir. You indicated your concern about our increasing national debt. Yeah. You also stated that you did not see any appetite among the de Democrats or the Republicans to stop the spending. Do you believe that term limits would be a, a solution for that? And do you think we will see term limits? I don't think we'll see term limits, and I don't believe it'll be a solution because it's funny, uh, when they get up there and Disneyland on the Potomac, whether they're there for one term or five terms, they still like to spend because that's what their constituents like. So it's really easy to spend. It's hard to be against spending. Uh, did I tell them the story that I told you about my camp when I was campaigning as attorney general? No, I'd like you to. I'm admit, gonna, I'm gonna tell you one story. It's a great story to end I, with and I promise I gotta, you, you'll be rewarded for staying. I gotta fly back to Houston. 
I got to fly back to Houston, but I know I'm in Austin, and I know I've sounded a lot like a, a doctrinaire Republican tonight, and I apologize for that. Only by comparison but, to but, the rest of the city. But Mr. that's Secretary. because. <laughs> Hey, because that's what, but that's because that's what I am. So I apologize for that. But I got to tell you that that after I had the, uh, I was a Democratic lawyer in Houston until 1970 when I lost a wife to cancer. I had a good friend at the time named George Bush. He was my tennis partner, and he came to me and he said, "You know, Bake, he said you got to get your mind off your grief and help me run for the Senate here in Texas." I said, "Well, George, that's a great idea, except for two things. Number one, I'm a I don't know anything about politics because I was apolitical. My grandfather used to tell the young lawyers who came to work for our firm in Houston, if you want to be, be a good lawyer, work hard, study, and keep out of politics. And that was my life for the first 40 years. I, didn't, I did vote occasionally, but not often. And I stayed out of politics. So I told George when he asked me to help him with his Senate race, I said, well, I'd, uh, that's great except for two things. One, I, I don't know anything about politics. And two, I'm a Democrat. He said, you know, we can fix that latter problem. <laughs> and we did, and I became uh, a Republican. And I went up there, and, and a few years later, I found myself running President Ford's campaign against Jimmy Carter, chairman of the campaign, seven years after being a Democratic lawyer in Houston, Texas. And I never will forget, we lost that election by only 10,000 votes out of 81 million votes that were cast. You turn 10,000 votes around in Ohio and Hawaii, and Ford would have been elected and Carter wouldn't. And I remember thinking to myself at 3 o'clock in the morning, boy, is this bizarre. Seven years ago, you were a Democratic lawyer in Houston, Texas, and now you've run a campaign for a Republican presidential, for a, an incumbent Republican president in what is obviously going to be the closest presidential election of your lifetime. Who well, knew? That, so, so anyway, I got, by then I, I, I got interested in politics. And I, after we lost, I thought, you know, I'm going to try my hand at this game. I've been a lawyer for 17 years. I'm going to go home in Texas and run for office. So I filed to run for attorney general here in Texas because I've been a lawyer for a long time. And I thought legal ability might make a difference. Little did I know. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I filed to run for attorney general, and I never will forget one hot summer day. I'm campaigning somewhere up in the panhandle. And I see some people over the shopping center, and I go over there to give them some campaign uh, literature. And bear in mind now, I've gotten a lot of face time on national television as Ford's campaign chairman. So I go over to give campaign literature to, to this group, and I see this guy, and I hand it to, like this, stick it out for him to take, and then offer my hand, introduce myself to him. He looks at me, and he says, say, said, anybody ever tell you you look like Jim Baker? <laughs> and I said, yes, sir, often. This guy never batted an eyelash. He looked, he looked back at me and said, doesn't it piss you off? <laughs> so. <laughs> well. <laughs> I, like, hey, that I was, like that. Hey, that was the first clue I had that I might not win that race for the <laughs> That's right. Well, I like when you end on a good story. Let's just call it at that. Please join me in welcoming and thanking again Secretary Baker. I want to tell you how much I enjoyed this. It was great. It was fun. It was fun. We'll do it again sometime. I look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you.